हाय देविका हाय रॉबिन आनंद हाय जोबिन हेलो या आई स्टार्टेड द लाइव ओके शुड वी वेट फॉर अ कपल ऑफ मिनट्स बिफोर वी बिगिन या या वी कैन वेट नो इशू आई जस्ट स्टार्टेड द लाइव वी कैन या या और शुड जोबिन बी द कोहोस्ट टू या कैन यू प्लीज मेक हिम द कोहोस्ट एज वेल जोबिन Thank you, Arun. Thank you, Devika. Uh, all right should we begin sure yeah uh, so thanks everyone for coming today and probably we'll start with anand first anand's questions from the yes, query sheet sounds good uh, so wait what what am i am i supposed to do something and open something oh um So do you have access to the query sheet that I sent you yesterday? Uh oh, you sent the query sheet yesterday. Sorry. <laughs> ah, this is I was wondering what what did I do? Yes, maybe now I have. Can you to. sorry? Can you also uh, send it to me, or maybe Jobin had sent? But can you resend in case yes. I have missed? Yes. Sorry, I found it. I have it open now. This is the Excel sheet, right? Yeah, uh, Google sheet. Google sheet. Sorry, uh, my yeah. bad. Yeah. Uh, I have it open right now. So, how do I know which questions are for me? Ah, uh, some questions actually are addressed to you. Okay. Ah, uh, yeah. Please enter it here. Okay. So I'm going to check. The first one is not. Ah, uh, could you please explain more on the spectrogram color map used by BirdNet mobile app? Ah, uh, what are these for? I have never used the BirdNet mobile app, so I don't know. But uh, maybe somebody who has can answer that. <laughs> I don't use apps. I am I I am a creature of the Stone Age. I don't even use the eBird app. I I put all my stuff on manually on a computer, like like uh, they used to when I was younger. Uh, the next thing is not a question. So the other is also mimicry. So that's not directed at me. 
uh good afternoon ma'am good afternoon ma'am though that is both manjari i think ah here's one for me are oscillograms and power spectrums used even today for research or is it only spectrograms uh yes oscillograms and power spectrums are used very frequently even today for research um actually they're probably much more reliable uh, from a quantitative perspective than spectrograms are spectrograms are after all a processed version of Uh, well i mean i mean a power spectrogram is a power spectrum it's just a bunch of power spectrums stacked together in time right um, but oscillograms are the base data that is used to generate a spectrogram so without an oscillogram you can't have one and in many cases particularly people who study frogs and crickets and other things tend to use oscillograms and power spectrums much more than spectrograms power spectra sorry my bad but um uh, yeah i think bird people tend to use spectrographic representations a lot more but that doesn't mean that oscillograms and power spectra are useless what is the mechanical mechanism of the harmonics that we see in sonograms a uh, harmonic oscillation sort of emerge from the properties of vocal structures which is that air moving over something sets it in vibration and as a result it will have overtones uh, aka harmonics the same way that many musical instruments also have harmonics most biological sounds or sounds produced by vibrating structures just inherently have harmonics in them uh from the physical properties of how they how they vibrate uh, and if i forgot something as part of that answer manjari help but <laughs> uh but other than that uh yeah that's that's my answer to that question uh the next two questions are both for manjari and the two questions after that are for robin and uh, the last question is about parakeet mimicry of humans so also not for me thanks yeah should we move okay. on to manjri's question sure okay okay devika uh, yeah. yeah there is a uh, sorry there is a, a, a question just came up uh just wondering whom it is directed to syrinx in missing Is missing in stocks. Uh, pelican. Well, a lot of pelican chicks make sounds. Uh, but I'm not. Uh, I I think pel pelicans have a syrinx. So, but I think only ostriches. Pelican. I think only vultures and ostriches probably are the ones who lack one. One right, Anand? I think. These no, the I think most of the large water birds don't have elaborate syringes either. Yeah, I mean, uh, absence I, of syrinx is uh, probably only yeah. in vultures and maybe in ostriches um, also. Yeah, I think a, a, the pelicans don't have a particularly well developed syrinx, but it is a so pelicaniforms have a tracheal syrinx. I just looked that up uh, somewhere. uh but so pelicaniforms have a tracheal syrinx so but they're not particularly vocal birds they make a lot of wheezy clattery noises but yeah that's the answer to that <laughs> and yeah. there's one more question for you the last question yeah can i just answer that in the chat or would you prefer that i answer it by voice yeah i think yeah um, i mean the chat should be okay Yeah. Then, because it's not related to this lecture, let me answer it by chat, and then Manjuri can go on and answer her questions. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Anand. Thank you. Manjuri, over to you. Yes. Yes, uh, Devika. I'm just uh, trying to read these. Um, so, can you please explain the difference uh, between duet and mimicry for species we don't know or never heard their voice or just say it's the name of bird given in a question and we don't actually so uh, i am not somehow very good at this you know i can jobin if you don't mind can i bug you can you help me read this because it goes on sure 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 i'll i'll do I, that i can't see to, yeah. to the end of the excel uh, sheet i'll do that i'll do that So the question is, can you hear me? Sorry. Yes, yes, Jobin, I can hear ah, you. Okay. So question is how? Okay. Huh, how you can you please explain how to differentiate between duet and mimicry for the species we don't know or never heard their voice or just say it's the name of two birds given in a question and we actually don't know how they sing. 
more okay. this is yeah. for okay so so for first of all more conceptually what is the difference between duetting and mimicry mimicry is when you copy the uh, uh, the vocalizations of another uh, species or other sounds in the environment duetting is when one individual produces a vocalization and another individual responds okay and this response could be using the same exact same notes it could be different notes or whatever so that is duetting versus mimicry and how would we know whether it is the original vocalization of an uh, of uh, a species or the uh, mimicked vocalization the answer to the question is it is not uh, straightforward unless you know a, a lot about the birds repertoire to begin with so it is a tough question to ask uh, and that is also one of the reasons why actually getting the repertoire the true repertoire of individuals who are mimicking species is a non trivial task where you can uh, unambiguously assign uh, a note to be part of its own original repertoire and not something that it has uh, picked up at a later uh, stage uh, and or is mimicking uh, you know um, some other sound of that it has heard so to me it is a uh, it, it is not easy this is not something one can do easily and therefore one has to be very careful one has to be uh, very conservative when addressing these questions uh, okay. next okay manjuri uh, there is a question uh, which you have already answered on the forum should i repeat that would you like to answer no 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 okay. no and also some of these i think are from uh, samira because she must uh, she has given one entire lecture but i mean whatever i think i can i will address but anand uh, robin please guys pitch in if you think that i'm missing something okay so uh, uh, there is a question that how do you understand uh, between two species uh, who is actually miming and who is a model so you've already uh, answered that there's another question for you is there a particular reason for relative rarity of okay polyandry and promiscuity and the abundance of monogamy through uh, though with epc could head yes through... i mean there was one entire lecture on this actually yeah the entire lecture talks about exactly why monogamy is far more common in birds than one would than what one would think and part of the reason lies in the physiology where you know the bird uh, there is internal fertilization part of the reason is the uh, uh, requirements of the offsprings i mean this entire lecture is there so i'm sure you'll find your answers there so the next question is uh, okay there was a one more part to it uh, could heterogametic or homogametic characters be attributed to this observation like polyandry and promiscuity basically sorry i was reading the chat message tell me again uh, what is the um, sorry uh, so uh, there is a second part to it could heterogametic or homogametic characters be attributed to this observation of uh, monogamy and polyandry and promiscuity uh, actually if uh, these questions have been asked by previous uh, previously in the discussion forum and i I I I worry that people are not aware of the discussion forum. I have answered all of these questions in great detail in the discussion forum. Exact question, in fact, whether heterogamity has anything to do with it, so on and so forth. So yeah. I really uh, uh, urge everybody, please. Uh, it's a little bit of extra effort. Can you please go to the discussion forum? We have answered these questions in great detail. Okay. So the uh, short answer is no. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it's a, this one is again for you um are there any differences of a noticeable extent in assemblages like ring species and how does the complex breeding pattern affect courtship ring species uh, robin do you want to take this and uh, maybe a little more specific uh, thing would help you know what does one really mean by similarity what kind of similarity vocal or what i am not sure Robin, do you want to take this question about ring species? Um, I think maybe he's not on the call. Yeah. So he's he's here. I think he's on mute or something. Yeah. So um. if i understand correctly you are asking how do we distinguish uh, by any trait uh, species that belong to a ring species assemblage is is that the question uh, jobin can you uh, 
Uh, yeah, I'll read that again. Yeah. Are are there any differences of a noticeable extent in assemblages <clears throat> like ring species? And how does the complex breeding pattern affect courtship? I mean, I'm not finding any link between the first and the second part, but so so uh, I mean, what what I can answer more broadly that you know, if we ask the question, how do we draw species boundaries? Okay, let me put it this way: drawing species boundaries is not a trivial task, and uh, uh, these days, typically, what we are doing is uh, okay. So classical taxonomy. uh taxonomists used uh, morphological traits including uh, uh, plumage coloration and uh, you know size differences so on and so forth but also genetic traits uh, uh to distinguish uh, between species and draw species boundaries but now more and more we are using what is known as an integrative taxonomic approach and in which we use both uh, classical taxonomy behavior and in uh, in case of birds a very strong element of acoustics is there so we use bird song we also use molecular data to draw species boundaries and uh, when we say noticeable extent if it means to the human eye it may not be and remember it's a continuum so how do you de define a species is not uh, easy to say this is one species and then these are not like distinct blocks these can be like continuous and it's a process the pro process of speciation itself uh, is kind of a continuum in most cases okay but in some cases you can distinguish them very distinctly based on clear cut uh, morphological traits and humans can do it but in other cases it may not even be possible and molecular data can erect new species maybe a uh, robin you can uh, add to this uh, how molecular data can be used to erect uh, new species which is not i mean even when we cannot see differences between uh, uh, species okay i think he is not getting an audio feedback maybe someone should message yeah sorry oh, I, oh, i'm not okay. a co-host anymore so uh, because i rejoin uh, so i'm not able to unmute myself so if i mute myself then i can't unmute so that's a maybe uh, the iit folks can uh, make me co-host again please i messaged as well uh, yeah um, uh, sorry manjri i was just trying to figure that out so the the specific question is about uh, uh, species boundary is that uh, what yeah i mean how do you distinguish uh... uh species in a uh, ring species assemblage i think basically it uh, the person is referring to how do you make the species boundaries how when uh, differences are not noticeable or something to that effect i think yeah i think that's that's a tricky business as manjri was saying um uh, you can use multiple variables and we can only do um, for some things we can do statistics and show that they are significantly different uh you know one group from the other uh but you don't know if that is still biologically relevant um so for example people can uh you know build models and test whether uh one bird recognizes the other uh you the way to do that with song is to do some playback um so these are all possible uh but it takes a lot of work to carefully assess this there's very few groups where this has been done uh, carefully yeah i hope that kind of answers that yeah i i think so so basically what we are saying is there's enough room for people to you know work on this topic it's really a very uh, a tough question and uh, um, uh, the best way forward is to use as many tools as you can to uh, Uh, examine the species, or rather, examine the specimens more carefully from all perspectives: classical taxonomy, behavior, as well as molecular data. Jobin, does this help? I think so. Can we move on to the next question then? Yes, yes, please. You, yeah. you, you take that call. And okay. So the next question is for you, Manjri. Um, first is any studies available on how yellow bill babblers differ from jungle babblers with respect to acoustics question mark i don't think there are any studies on the acoustics of yellow bill babbler which are published uh, robin right 
the yeah, yeah i don't know of any yeah. we do have vocalizations of the yellow bill babbler and we have conducted several experiments and we know that they are different but we haven't published <laughs> okay then next question is how can we distinguish from sensory uh motor and crystallized from just spectrograms or is direct observation the only way uh distinguish between from sensory s motor practice songs and crystallized from just spectrograms okay so uh, sensory motor and uh, chris uh, sorry can you still see me yeah yeah so these are basically phases of learning song learning and uh, in different phases of song learning the song structure is going to be different for instance when the song has not yet crystallized they produce lot of uh, uh, practice songs or what we call as uh, sub songs where the structure is unique and extremely different from the breeding song um, of the bird this can be seen in the spectrogram but for that if it's a new if it's a species which has never been studied before it's you know the problem becomes kind of circular you don't know what is a crystallized song so you really have to do controlled experiments where you rear the birds you know exactly what stage of their life they are in and then you uh, make these recordings you look at how the um, various um, acoustic parameters and that's how you make those comparisons okay if it is something that you have already know what the breeding song looks like there then then it becomes much easier it is simply about comparing acoustic features and these can be done uh, not not with too much difficulty using a spectrogram one can do these very easily theek hai ha uh, the next question is do birds eavesdrop on insect frogs or fishes so i actually answered something similar uh, in the discussion forum so eavesdropping again i will answer this more conceptually eavesdropping happens when an, an unintended receiver utilizes the information in a signal in a manner that the eavesdropper benefits and the signaler may be disadvantaged or may not be affected but the receiver the unintended receiver or the eavesdropper always benefits number 1 number 2 eavesdropping is possible at any time if the signal is public or has public information which means it is uh, in case of vocal signals it is audible to the eavesdropper so if insects are producing sounds which the bird can hear so now for instance a cricket is producing a sound which a particular bird can hear then it can potentially eavesdrop okay but if a cricket is producing sound which no matter how loud it is but it is in an ultrasonic range and the bird cannot hear then it cannot eavesdrop so it is more a matter of whether it can perceive or not uh functionally can they do that yes they can they can eavesdrop on uh, birds can eavesdrop on insects as well as on uh, frogs fishes i don't know it the sound transmission has to cross the barrier of two different sound mediums so okay the next question uh, can also be uh, addressed to robin but uh, the question is are sholakilis open ended as they have a wide and complex repertoire any examples of open ended learners in indian oscenes actually i i don't know the answer to that um and uh, i mean because it it you know the way this whole open ended business uh, works is that you need that information about how birds learn songs um i don't know anand uh, or manjri would you have any idea if there are any known open ended learners where it's been i think there is some work by uh, professor dinesh but uh on uh, i think drongos uh, i i don't remember which drongo but i think on some drongo there is there is some work uh, um, please look at the research of professor dinesh but from uh, gurukul kangri university he has done some work on uh, song anything learning that, uh, anything that mimics frequently is by default an open ended learner right because they will add mimicry to their repertoire throughout their lives so uh, Chloropsis, shamas are all likely to be open-ended learners. Likely right? to be, but uh, confirmed where confirmed you actually parrots, parrots. Okay. 
So if we want an open-ended, any any parakeet in India is an open-ended learner again, because that is obviously simply confirmed by the fact that they learn human speech. So this again, uh, Jobin, just again uh, reminding everybody, um, so, very similar questions I have just addressed in the discussion forum about open-ended and close-ended learning. And there are there are in birds there are only three orders in which. Uh, vocal learning exists and this includes songbirds of course parrots and uh, more recently now we know also hummingbirds so please do peep into the discussion forum you might find lot of answers already there the next question is uh, okay it's not a question it's basically a request for some reading material on neurobiology of song learning especially studies in india so i, I think yeah, you can, uh, for studies in India, you can look at work of Soumya Ayangar. She does a lot of neuroanatomy. Uh, in, in, uh, she, she works in NBRC, Professor Soumya Ayangar. She uh, uh, has examined uh, what parts of the brain and what kind of, you know, uh, circuitry is required for uh, uh, song learning and things like that. Then there's Raghav Rajan. Anand, maybe you want to talk about Raghav's work? Yeah, uh, Raghav's at Isar Pune. So uh, he studies uh, preparatory motor activities that initiate song in birds and also whether these activities are learned. So he's somebody else that can be looked at on that front as well. So yeah, there's, there's, there's that much work for India. For books, I, do, I guess uh, there's Nature's Music, right? Which would have all the information that one needs about song learning and birds in a sort of easy to understand way and it doesn't blitz you over the head with all the information you need. So. Yeah, and then I, I completely recommend Nature's Music. That's a great, uh, it's a great book. All right, moving on to the next question. Uh, again, from Manjari. Uh, there is a mention about tutoring by male birds in the vicinity or the father of the individual juveniles. If only male birds teach, is it because female birds do not have a song repertoire or is it that females do not teach? Oh, no, no, no. This was just making an example that how birds may pick up songs and this picking up the song could be from tutors and who would these tutors be? These tutors could be the parents. For instance, if the father is singing nearby, one could pick up the song from the father. But in many species, again, <laughs> I just answered these questions in the discussion forum female song and it was mentioned in the lecture as well female so bird song traditionally was thought of as a, a very male trait and now we know that is not true many species of birds do also have females uh, that sing and this is not just vocalizations or calls but they actually have songs so it is definitely i mean if if that uh, gave you the impression that only no it's definitely not just the males who sing it's also the females but in spe certain species not in all species and a tutor can be anyone a tutor can be uh, even the foster I mean, not, did not necessarily be uh, the exact uh, the, the genetic father right it could be a parent who is raising uh, the chick uh, so in the sense in the same species brood parasitism this can happen uh, the next question is again for you. Um, do song learning young birds include both genders or is it only the male young who learn or are taught? So again, uh, uh, female song earlier was not uh, worked on very uh, extensively, but now we know that there are many species in which the, bird, uh, the females also have uh, songs. And if it helps, what I can do is in the discussion forum, is if someone can post this, I can send you some papers or references just so that you get a feel for it. So it is not a male uh, specific thing. But definitely in some species, it is only uh, uh, the male birds that have uh, songs or at least elaborate vocalizations, which we call as songs. And the females have only calls. For example, purple sunbird, the females have only one note calls and then some trills. But the males have very elaborate phrases. Okay. Uh, but that is not true. It's not true that all birds, only the males have elaborate songs. The females do have songs. So, uh, Jobin, if someone can post this on the discussion forum, I can send the references or I can send it to you and you can share with the rest. Sure, that works. Also that, there's also that paper by Payne's group, right, about uh, indigo birds, where the males learn the song and the females learn the preference for a certain song. 
within the nest right is uh, uh, I, I suppose that might be something they might want to look up to yeah and also like we mentioned in the lecture itself the females may also uh, uh, choose the mates based on their ability to learn songs okay so which also means they need to have a template of what they are comparing with right so all of that is there even if they are not vocalizing per se so it is much more than just making the calls even to compare you need to have you need to have the template uh, robin should you, uh, would you mind answering the question before we move on to the zoom chat uh, which one is that okay i'll just uh, just a second um, okay so could you uh, you had mentioned that notes are undivided small parts in the spectrograms so are mini breaths included in notes or do they help separate notes? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah. So the thing is, you know, uh, uh, it's not like the birds are saying this is my note, right? It's just that we are kind of uh, making these up uh, from uh, how we can quantify uh, songs. But mini breaths are actually a very technical thing and people quantify it, you know, they uh, when they have these, uh, I mean, I don't know, maybe Anand could answer this better, but, you know, technically to kind of say something is a mini breath, uh, what Raghav at least told me is that you need these sensors and things like that place. And then you know that it's actually breathing when it's not making uh, those sounds and things like that. But well, there physically, is a if you consider, physically, if you consider it, if a structure is vibrating and air is flowing in the opposite direction at the same time, there is no way to tell that from a spectrogram because a spectrogram is only going to give you the sum of the emitted vibrations in a power tra in a in a transformed way and if you get that there is absolutely nothing you can say about how much air is going into the bird's lungs so in order to do that yeah as robin said you need to actually have respiratory sensors introduced into the bird there is absolutely no way to tell that a bird is doing mini breaths otherwise you can't in fact the only way you can tell whether a bird is using two syringes at once is if it produces two notes that overlap that are not harmonics the that, that is the only way you can tell that a bird is using two syringes at once. If it's like a cardinal using two syringes to produce one half of each note, you couldn't have told without the experiment. That's so right. Yeah. It's, yeah, it, these are very, very important, very difficult experiments to do. <laughs> yeah. And please do look up, you know, if you just uh, uh, Google, I think Cor Cornell has this very nice uh, uh, video. It's an animation of the cardinal's uh, uh, dual syrinx usage. Uh, and uh, and compare it with the nightingale because that I think uh, I think it's a nightingale I don't remember which is the other one no the wood thrush wood thrush which has uh, uh, two different sounds at the same time if I remember right uh, so uh, they have these two animations on their website uh, you can just Google it and you'll you'll reach it it's not very difficult to find uh, it's really so worthwhile to say that those experiments are almost impossible to do in India because you will almost certainly never get permits to actually do them. Yeah. So Anand, yeah. so Anand actually uh, virtually answered that question for you, which is that uh, uh, we don't know if really these are, you know, dual siring usage, but um, uh, there are some shortcuts people have come up with, which is, you know, they look at uh, a specific gap between nodes and they say that, okay, if it is less than that gap. And so there is like, you know, Anand was saying, if there is an overlap, then it is most likely that because that's the only way to kind of tell. So, yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, okay. it looks like a lot of the questions, the answers are, are that uh, we don't have enough information to tell you. So these are research questions. Uh, but that also it. means there's a lot of scope. We need yeah. more people to work on all of this. Yeah, yeah, it's an emerging field as you can figure out by now. Yeah. Robin, there's one more question. I mean, there are a lot of questions for you. Uh, the second question is, have micro dialects of Shola Kilis of same species, same hill range, in isolated mountain top mountain tops being distinguished and mapped like Liu at all 2006 i think the white crown sparrow paper uh, uh, yeah well uh, so the the thing is this i mean yeah we do have some data on this uh, but uh, i what we have is some quantitative differences okay uh, which is not the same as the kind that they have done with the white crown sparrow where you have very clear, um, uh, you know, uh, spectrograms that show, okay, these syllables are found only here, these syllables are found only there, 
I mean, we have some indications of those syllables, but we what we have uh, is more a quantitative uh, description that the songs differ. I hope that's kind of answers the question. So yes, there is some information, but not so detailed as the kinds that uh, we would like. So we this is work in progress. Okay. There's one more. Safe, uh, is it safe to say that we have more information about dialect differences between ornithologists than we do between the birds? <laughs> that's why. That's why three of us give three different, three different dialectic perspectives on a bioacoustics through an entire lecture. <laughs> yeah. No, but this is great, right? I mean, I don't think you get this kind of perspective, uh, which is very integrative, uh, and I'm not sure if uh, all the uh, course participants. Uh, you know, I can appreciate that because uh, we come from, we, we are kind of hitting these things from slightly different angles. And uh, so the people who are really gaining, of course, we gain from interaction from each other, but uh, all of you definitely are, uh, you know, this is a great, uh, this is a great place. I would have loved to have uh, these, inter you know, to be part of these interactions earlier in my career. So. Okay. Robin, um, can CBMs number of no, number per song, etc., be used to identify individual Shola Kelis? Like patterns are used for Panthera species. <laughs> yeah. So um, uh, here's um, what I always say. You know, uh, the the tiger research in India is very advanced, and uh, <laughs> I keep thinking that um, that is one way to follow it uh, is to look at all the tools that they use because they use natural history. They have a lot of natural history knowledge uh, coming from very great uh, naturalists, you know, following animals. They know how many young are there. You know, they know how far they disperse. They know individuals. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of information. And then they hit it with these advanced uh, scientific tools like genomics and, uh, you know, mark recapture methods and so on. So there's very few research on wildlife, which actually, uh, is able to kind of uh, incorporate that kind of uh, data just simply because you don't have that kind of information. So the short answer to your question is no, we can't do that because we don't know what is the level of individual specificity that is there in these specific notes of Shulakili. And um, I mean, I doubt if we know too much uh, of many other birds as well. I mean, but that would be the gold standard. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the next is. Has avian bioacoustics been used to measure degree of forest degradation with respect to benchmark sites? I just want to say I'm really loving some of these questions. I think the it's maybe my own biases, but uh, I love this session. It's great questions. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. These are great questions. They are actually they are actually research questions. Uh, these are all the kinds of questions that you know, could be a master's thesis or even a PhD thesis, uh, because uh, none of this is really done. You know, this deforestation, the kind of question that you're asking, there are some, um, uh, there are some studies that show the loss of certain kinds of syllables, you know, this cultural diversity. Uh, but uh, for that to, for, for one to demonstrate that kind of pattern, um, you know, you need all of this data of birds in natural habitats, then you need so much more data from deforested habitats, multiple replicates uh, of those deforested and forested habitats. And you also need multiple, you know, pseudo replicates from within that batch as well, just to kind of make sure that what you're getting is, in fact, the true um, uh, readout. So that kind of data is simply not there. So yeah, maybe one of you on this course, uh, but but also Anand has done uh, this kind of work. I really urge uh, you guys to read some of the more recent, or maybe Anand, maybe you can share it with Jobin, where uh, the soundscape of a habitat tells you a lot. It tells you about not just the community of uh, animals that reside there, but it can tell us uh, a lot about the anthropogenic impact. It can tell even uh, you, you can have different kinds of soundscape from different kinds of habitat types. So it is possible because the communities are going to be different. Degradation level, yes, it is possible. Whether it has been done in India or not, not so much. It's a very young field. Bioacoustics in India is a very young field. But Anand has looked at um, soundscapes in uh, two different grasslands and uh, like he has really interesting stories to tell you should uh, 
really look uh, look up that paper i really i don't, I don't usually say that i measure soundscapes partly because i'm not measuring everything i just look for birds right so yeah. technically i never use i use I, I i you know so we we've been doing that as well and uh yeah no thanks thanks for thanks for uh Shouting out to my paper, Manjali. That's very nice of you. No, no. But what I meant was, even uh, with the bird community, even if you have the same kind of habitat, you can get the starkly different uh, vocalizations, and the soundscape of the birds itself is going to be very different. Even if you have the same kind of habitat, so there's much more to. Uh, uh, I mean, there's a lot of information in the sound, but one has to read this information very carefully. Because yeah, we've used we've used bioacoustics to study spatial ecology, temporal ecology. We've done we've published works on that as well but one of the one of the more common approaches being used worldwide is to use overall sound spectra and put some sort of an index to it and i've been very opposed to that for a long time because uh one of my first studies i found out that those indices are very sensitive to the wrong things so they can uh, if if not used carefully they can give you very very incorrect results so we use a different approach to do that which is not it's it's much harder to get wrong, but it's also much harder to do. It takes months and months. Uh, it, it's still like one of those things where I spend and spend several hours of my day late at night or several hours of my day early in the morning just making going through hours and hours and hours of data until my hair has gone completely gray. So it's <laughs> it's it's not easy to do if you want to do it right, but it can be very rewarding and the fieldwork is great fun because you can record sounds early in the morning especially if you're working on birds and then spend the rest of the day drinking chai and having fun yeah but you can also look i mean for those of you who are more broadly interested in bioacoustics and under using bioacoustics as a tool for conservation you can and not specifically just for birds so uh, you can read uh, papers from uh, jerome sewer's group also he does a lot of work on um, soundscape ecology uh, and where looking at you know degradation of habitat using just soundscape um, anthropogenic impact all of this is there so i mean it's all out there you have to just google search for keywords robin's doing robin's doing work on it too so robin's doing robin's doing shola work and other things like that so robin's been developing these metrics for exactly these things as well so you know uh, we are now going into a sort of an era where a lot of people are doing what's called passive acoustic monitoring so the actual uh, exact word is and it was something that started off with whales and dolphins and is now moving on to our uh, our, our uh, you know more terrestrial realms but there are lots of people doing passive acoustic monitoring for whales and dolphins in india too including isha uh, so and they, bats and bats yeah we've done we've done work for bats uh, there's uh, a lot of stuff going on in bats as well. So frogs soon, crickets, manjari. <laughs> so we can we can get all sorts of cool stuff out of passive acoustic monitoring. Just it's it's uh, the data analysis is a slog. There's no there's no way around it. The data analysis is a slog. But um, you know, a lot to be fun. And if if they actually have an SCCS in person, uh, we do workshops at <laughs> the student conference in conservation science. So. Those of you who are eligible to attend that, uh, especially student attendees, uh, can attend our workshop on this exact subject where we talk about these things. Samira, Agnihotri, and myself talk about these things. And Viral, uh, the three of us run these workshops at SCCS. So you're always welcome to come if you want to learn a bit more in detail about it. OK, I'll move on to the next question. Um, do birds, I mean, this is again for Dr. <laughs> Robin, do birds communicate uh, communicate acoustically with other taxa like arboreal mammals? Uh, actually, this is more in the realm of Manjari than me. Uh, but uh, since it's addressed to me, I can start and then Manjari can uh, join in. Um, so I think that um, uh, it's uh, there is definitely uh, a lot of communication that happens, you know. So uh, it's just animal communication. And alarm calls are uh, often, um, you know, uh, they can be uh, heard by others and used by others, whether they are directed at some of the uh, uh, other mammals around, that is a slightly different and tricky question. Uh, but uh, uh, signals being uh, overheard and interpreted by others is, is fairly common. Manjari, over to you. Yes, exactly. Like I was saying, uh, eavesdropping, uh, I mean, how do you... Uh, uh, how do you uh, define communication? So the first 
slide usually that I have in my animal communication uh, uh, course is how do you define communication? And uh, typically uh, the agreed upon definition is that there is a signaler and at least so at least one signaler, there's one receiver and the signaler sends out some information. So signals which must contain some information that must be utilized by the receivers, which changes the receiver's behavior and the receiver responds in a manner that the signaler also benefits. So the most uh, widely accepted uh, uh, definition for communication is that both parties must benefit. And by that definition, and definitions are very useful. I mean, people look down upon definition, but definitions are useful because they draw the boundary conditions for us. Okay. And by that definition, eavesdropping would not qualify as communication because there is the, the eavesdropper is not the intended receiver, but it extracts information. And in that, of course, there are uh, ways in which uh, all kinds of sounds that animals produce can be utilized by other species and even uh, 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 individuals belonging to completely different groups. But the most uh, fascinating uh, uh, example between human and bird communication is uh, um, uh, what was that bird? Uh, the honey guides and uh, the, 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 uh, a particular uh, tribe somewhere in uh, Africa, I forget now. So there's this paper, you can just Google for it, human bird communication honey guide, and you will get it. So yes, there is some, which does not seem like eavesdropping and it is not clear how this could have evolved. So we don't know the answer to it, but uh, yes, it is possible, it is rare, and we don't understand how this happened. Okay. Um... So uh, some reading material on uh, limits of song variability within species. This is for Dr. Yeah. And this is for whom? <laughs> for you, Robin, sorry. Oh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, see this. Uh, so can you reread that question? Because um, limits of song variability, what is the last bit? Within species. Yeah. So here's the problem. Like, what is a species? You know, in some sense, it is a human construct. Uh, then, uh, you know, uh, once you have that, uh, you accept that there is some fluidity there, then you start seeing that there's way more fluidity in songs. So, um, because just how it is transmitted, it's culturally transmitted. Uh, so, uh, it is difficult. Uh, there is no hard boundary. Uh, but the way you can assess it is uh, two ways. One is if you're quantifying it, um, you get sufficient replicates to look at variability within individual, you get variability within a small population, and then you compare it between groups. And there are statistical uh, you know, methods that allow you uh, to look at how much variability you have within one, uh, you know, one set and then how much within that set and then between sets. Okay. So the differences should be over and above that. Uh, but this, what I'm describing is just a statistical, um, uh, you know, uh, you could have an artifact of just the, the data amount of data or something like that. Uh, you actually need to probably ask the birds uh, if there is a difference and the way you ask the birds is with carefully designed playback experiments. And I'm not talking about, you know, just playing something from your mobile phone and uh, uh, looking at that. That's really not a playback experiment. The uh, playback experiments need to be designed very carefully. And in fact, I, I, I haven't done playback experiments so far because it's just so challenging uh, to think of all the experimental processes that are required that my group, uh, I dissuade students from getting into a playback experiment un unless they uh, really know uh, enough to, uh, you know, to have a real um, uh, test that's possible. Okay, the next question. So, I mean, we have 10, que 10 minutes left and our 31 question in the chat box. So after this bit. I've been, yeah, I've been answering most of the questions in the Zoom chat box. Okay. Okay. Then there, there is one. Uh, there are, there's like a set of questions again for you. Yeah. Um, could you explain a bit on dual syrinx and non-linear dynamics of a single syrinx, especially how both are differentiated in spectrograms, or why they can't be differentiated? 
uh, I think Anand already answered this. We can move on. Okay. How can we be sure that the differentiation in song complexes are due to anthropogenic effects and not genetically differing populations? Yeah, this is partly answered in the chat box in a response to Gaia, I think. Um, uh, um, uh, yeah, so the, the, the problem with uh, the responses to anthropogenic noise uh, sort of questions is that bird songs vary, as we've all been telling you. Uh, yeah, so the, the, the correlation and causation that I think Suhail has been talking about in study design, that needs to be done very carefully. That needs to be teased apart very carefully. So you may find differences in population, but yeah, you know, is that really because of um, uh, you know uh, anthropogenic noise? So that needs to be tested with a set of controls and uh, historic data for such uh, song differences and so on are not there, especially from a country like India. Uh, so if you have seen some of the reading material, one of them is this uh, science paper on Anthropos at uh, the Golden Gate. Uh, uh, reserve. Um, and that is a fantastic study. And they were able to do it because they have data on the birds, you know, marked uh, population of birds for, I don't remember, like 50 years or 60 years or something like that. Uh, uh, but we don't have that. Uh, so what people like us then tend to do is do space for time comparisons, which means that we don't have replicates or data from different time points. We try to find a spatial replicate which matches the previous time point. So you try and compare, you know, areas without noise and with noise, and you, you know, try and make some uh, uh, inferences. So you do need to do that very carefully. Um, I think there's a second part about genetics. Uh, so for genetic differentiation, that needs to be tested. There are methods to do that. There are molecular markers and things like that that you can specifically use to test that, and you could do that. But you know, if if uh, if it's a small area, there are no geographical barriers, uh, and if you know the ecology of the bird, I think it should be fairly simple to design a study within um, a certain population. Uh, so you know that you're not looking at differences between genetically different populations. I hope that's clear. Okay, there are there are more questions from Savant at all. Um, any new inferences from an ecological and conservation perspective? from the song variability index and note variability index. Can these be used to further the results from Purushottam at all? Yeah, that is again a research question. We are trying to do that. So um, yeah, stay tuned. I mean, look at our uh, lab website. I think we should be able to. Yeah, OK. So I think, uh, Robin, uh, there's one more question if somebody can answer. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Where can I? find more research information on parrot mimicry of humans? Anand. Irene Pepperberg, right? I shall put Can you repeat that? Chat. I'll put the name in the chat, Irene Pepperberg. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll put the name in the chat for people. They should look uh, up her work. Okay, so there's, uh, I'm, I'm moving on to the chat box right now. Uh, okay, some of these questions are repeated. I'll just still read it. I mean, I'll just read them. Is there a mapping of calls to their meaning for some of the birds, if not all? What about for songs? Mapping of calls. To their yeah, this has been done for many bird species, including of uh, including birds in India. Context specific uh, vocalization has can only be done if you also do uh, behavioral observations in conjunction with making recordings of the call and analyzing the calls. So yes, this has been done and can be done. What else? Uh, Dr. Manjari, please suggest the instruments required to record bird call songs, make and model. I want to try and record and try out what I have learned. Number one, you should definitely attend Anand's uh, and Robin also does has uh, conducted uh, a few uh, very nice uh, workshops for people who are interested in bioacoustics in India. So please attend that in great detail. They explain uh, the instrumentations required, but very uh, briefly, if you have the money, then get yourself a Sennheiser uh, directional mic and a Marans recorder. If you go to the website of Sennheiser and if you go to the website of Marans, you'll know the model. I don't remember the model, make and model. Marans is M-A-R-A-N-T-Z, right? Yeah. yeah. 
Okay, dear madam and sir, are there any differences in bird songs with geographical location for a particular species? Yes, in many species. Okay. I, actually, I would just say, uh, you know, go through the go through the lecture because yeah. that has a lot of detail. Yes. Uh, okay, this is um, yeah. In eBird, there are detailed questions regarding the bird call, bird songs, etc. Are songs and calls the same or are the calls only alarm calls? As lay people, how do we submit the recordings as calls or songs? Vocalizations, when you don't know anything else. And calls, this again was discussed in the lecture. Calls are typically um, uh, produced uh, in a variety of context. Songs are produced in a limited context, typically in display or for mate attraction. Uh, songs are typically longer bouts of vocalizations, whereas calls are shorter bouts of vocalization. Melody should not be used as a form of, uh, uh, as a criteria to categorize them. It is there in the first two, three uh, minutes of the vocal behavior part that I covered. So see the recording. It's covered there. And some Thank birds you. put call notes in their songs. So it's the, it, it, the things get even more complicated when you think about that. Because zebra finches, for instance, frequently put call notes in their songs. So uh, in between in between parts of their song. So that's just adding additional complexities to it. So what Manjuri says is absolutely right. It's when you're not sure, just put vocalizations. Can you please suggest books or websites to learn spectrogram of bird songs from basic level? I think this. Don't go for books is what I will say, unless you are going to use bioacoustics in a more uh, deeper and meaningful way uh, as a career option or for, you know, your job or something like that. If you want to just explore something, I would say, please attend these workshops, learn some of these things, try your hand out. And uh, if you buy your uh, equipment, the one, uh, the one um, advice I give my students is read the manual. Everything you need to know is there in the manual. Everything. Whether, how do you read a polar plot? How do you uh, understand what is uh, the FFT? How do you understand what is, uh, uh, you know, fast? Uh, whether you should take uh, RMS value, whether you should take peak to peak, all of this will be there in the manual. So that is a book you should read if you want to understand the basics. Over and above that, I think you should invest only if you are really seriously into this. Okay. How do birds navigate while flying? Do they follow sound cues originating from their group members' chicks? Or do they have a visual memory for navigation? So group movement, uh, for instance, uh, can utilize, uh, so birds can utilize sound cues uh, for movement, but that does not mean migratory species necessarily use that uh, to coordinate their uh, navigation at least for in the specific context of migration we know that there are certain other cues um, including the earth's magnetic field I, I think there will be a special lecture on migration so if it is to do with migration please wait for that lecture you might be able to get some of your answers there so sound cues can be used but it is not the only way in which animals coordinate movement or navigation uh, or birds navigate in mimicking bird species, do males mimic other males with better song of same species to attract females? If I were a bird and if I could mimic someone who is a better singer, then why not? That is how I think. But uh, uh, I don't know whether some research has been done which has... Uh, uh, established one that it is a better male or a better singer what is a better male or a better singer the female has to decide that and then it has to establish that it was not the original repertoire of the mimicking individual and only then you can say so, so you see there are many hindrances to this very uh, seemingly uh, you know innocent question but it's a very tough question to answer it should be possible but we don't i i don't know at least if some research has clearly unambiguously shown this i'm skipping some which are not related to uh, some questions that are not related to acoustics bioacoustics um, is it ethical to use uh, recording of bird songs to attract birds for research purpose do we need to get ethical clearance for this yes you need clearance 
um, from the forest department, but also from the animal ethics committee that you have in your uh, institute. And uh, let me assure you, these are not easy to acquire. Uh, second, uh, it is ethical as long as you're not stressing out uh, the bird and you know exactly what you're doing. You have planned your experiment. These are tough experiments to do. You need to have planned your experiments and you should not use playback beyond a certain few uh, seconds. So there are a lot of protocols um, involved. Yeah, I mean, Robin will add to this. Yeah, no, I just want to add that uh, I did cover a little bit of this in my uh, talk as well. And um, the idea is, uh, you know, that birds use song actually in a very, like, it's a very serious uh, effort that they put to produce this sound. And it's energetically very expensive for them to do because all the time that they're singing, they're not feeding and, you know, they're not doing many other things. So uh, for us, it's just a click of a button on a mobile phone. Uh, but what you're doing is actually hijacking a whole system that is already set in place. So you get them to respond. Um, and you probably, uh, you know, uh, it's a, it's driving an evolutionary like process in some way. Uh, I would, so try just to see a bird using playback. It's like using a big sledgehammer to crack a nut. So if you want to use playback, use it to answer some very specific questions for which the answer can only be had by playback. And then think about how you should design the playback experiment. How many songs will you expose a specific individual bird to? and how frequently you would do that. And these are the things that should come up uh, in your ethics committee meeting. And these are the things you should think about before doing playback as well. So in general, to see a bird, do not use playback. Just you know, uh, uh, do it with uh, your ecological knowledge and patience. And that's how you should see birds. Uh, if you want to use playback, do it for specific purposes with a lot of careful thought. Okay. Is it possible that birds called especially ground birds is in an audible range which cannot be heard by its predators? Basically, the ground birds uh, call in an audible range which cannot, I mean, in a range which cannot be heard by the predators. Depends who the predator is. So if, if, uh, if uh, a bird is to be, uh, is being picked up by an organism that can hear in the audible spectrum, uh, then it can hear it. So it depends upon the predator. If, if it was a bat, then it would have ha it would have a higher frequency hearing and lower frequency it would not hear. So that is how you should look at it. Okay. There are a few questions which have already been answered. Difference between call and courtship calls, and. Uh... Oh, okay. This is in continuation of an answer on open-ended learners. What I understand from mimicry is in minor parrots is that they repeat what they hear, but it, okay. But it is not always that they remember it. So can just repeating a sound be termed as learning? Should I repeat the question? Sorry. <laughs> I won't learn anything from that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's a good one. So that's the answer. <laughs> Okay. Um, okay. Are there brood parasites whose songs are also learned and not only innate? I don't know of any, but uh, I'm not sure. I think, uh, uh, again, conceptually, just thinking about it, if it's a brood parasite, then for it to learn the song, either it should learn the song after it, uh, I mean, the entire process must, must start after it fledges out and is independent but then the question is where will it learn its song from so um, I, I would imagine most would be in it is there anatomical anatomy anatomical difference between male and female syringes of same species especially species in which singing as a function is limited to males is there any evidence of sort of disuse atrophy anand Sorry, uh, disused atrophy. What? In yeah, females. Females. Um, I don't. I would. I would not say so. Females are not non-vocal, right? So I think to say that females are not using their syrinx is incorrect. So sorry, here's my video. Um, 
I would, uh, I don't think the differences are necessarily so much at the level of syringeal structure as much as they are at the brain regions that control these syringeal structures. So that's how I might look at it. But uh, there are some cases where there are certain structural differences, but not something that you would think is so dramatic that to say that the female syrinx is atrophy. Also, it's a very Lamarckian argument, this use versus uh, use and disuse thing. So I think we should not go there. Yeah, vestigialis. The syringeus vestigialis. No, it is not, that is not the case. Uh, but, uh, but the you know, differences between males and females do exist at the brain. So those, those are there. And those are largely driven by testosterone. And to a certain degree, estradiol, I believe, but testosterone primarily. According to theory in open habitat, birds have high frequency, but also in noisy environments. Also birds use high frequency. So can you explain a bit to make it clear? I'm a little bit confused in these two. Manjuri, you we are all me. can answer. Who should answer? <laughs> should we all say no <laughs> simultaneously? <laughs> I mean, uh, I, 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 yeah, I, I can I start anything just because Manjuri has actually done work on this and Manjuri and I have both found evidence that that supposed trend does not really exist. Uh, so, you know, stay tuned. It is quite controversial in many ways. And as to the higher frequency and noise finding, there are findings about that sort of thing. But I also know that there are a lot of people who work in bioacoustics think that finding is very controversial just yeah. because of noise being mismeasured. And mismeasured? Uh, yeah. yeah, and but if you want to know more about why I talked about why amplitude is difficult to measure in my lecture, so you can also go and look at that. But Manjuri has a bunch of really good insights on this exact topic, so she should take over the rest of this answer. So, so you know, uh, the, this was this really nice, fancy, or at least I once thought very fancy, nice hypothesis, the acoustic adaptation hypothesis, where the uh, the organisms have evolved. Uh, in a particular habitat in which they live so then they are expected their vocalization is expected to be matched again very adaptationist view but overwhelming evidence uh, suggests that it is not necessarily upheld in a range of taxa not just birds insects and uh, you know mammals it is not necessarily upheld but uh, the, the the idea that you know lower frequency in higher uh, in open habitats and higher uh, sorry uh, higher frequency in open habitat lower frequency in um, close habitat I am sure Robin has covered this in his lecture about transmission benefits and in a close habitat you will get more reflection from uh, 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 habitat structure right so one expects this but there are so many other driving forces selective forces that can drive the vocal evolution of signals. So that needs to be accounted for. The second thing that whether anthropogenic uh, noise can drive higher frequency. So uh, the, uh, like Anand said, that it is a debatable uh, kind of an argument. There is something called, so uh, you can read the papers of uh, Slabakun. Uh, this is Hans Slabakun. He's worked extensively on uh, a noise uh, driving the uh, uh, birds to call with higher notes, so on and so forth. But also, read the work of uh, Henrik Broom, where he, uh, he has all, and his group who has talked about how when you are in a noisier habitat, uh, there is something called the Lombard effect where you produce louder sounds and an artifact of producing the lar larger, uh, louder sound is that your pitch is going to be uh, shifted slightly to the higher. So whether they are producing a peak uh, higher notes to escape noise is what is being questioned. What is being argued is they are escaping noise, not necessarily by the peak shift of their frequency, but by producing louder sound, which is the Lombard effect. So you, you can read up about the Lombard effect and uh, how it confounds with this peak shift. So it is, yeah, the answer is it's not straightforward. You cannot say it is because of anthropogenic noise that they are shifting to higher frequencies. I, I hope you guys are reading all the compliments for you as well. Um, I'm not reading it out loud over here. Uh, the, I, I'll take this as the last question because we have already overshot some 10 minutes. Uh, so what are the drawbacks of ornithologists working in India compared to other countries? What I'm is the difference? Oh, you have? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. Okay. So after this, all the questions are answered actually. Okay, then. Yeah. So then, then I think 
Yeah. If you have any follow-up questions, please write it in the discussion forum or on and off. We do uh, access it and respond. <laughs> All right. Then, uh, Devika, do you want to say something? Uh, not really. I guess it's we have overshot already. So, yeah. Thanks a lot, everyone. Thanks, yeah. uh, Robin, Manjiri, and Anand for taking out your time. Yeah. Yeah, farewell. farewell great chatting with you three also, Manjri and Anand. Hi, Jobin. Anand. Yeah. Bye, Robin. Bye, Anand. Jobin. <laughs> Devika, thank you so much. And yeah, sorry. Thanks, Robin and Devika. So yeah, you guys are so good. Yeah, I'm not answering very quickly. And uh, yeah. Okay, thanks. This was good fun. Bye. Bye. Thanks a lot. Bye. So long, humans. <laughs>